I didn't go to my P.O. box for like a week or two, uh, just because for the first few weeks of my winter break, I just wanted to relax. And then it snowed in Washington. And when it snows in Washington, no one knows how to fucking drive. Anyway, a couple of days ago, I stopped by my P.O. box again. And uh, well, I'm not even sure this is all of just the Christmas stuff. But yeah, have I mentioned that I have the best fucking fans? Oh, and if I don't have an at to shout out, I'm just going to say the first name of the person who sent it to me. With all that out of the way, Holy shit! Thank you to Manda for sending me a limited edition X-Force Deadpool Build-A-Bear. I have absolutely no idea where the fuck I'm gonna put him, but I fucking love it! Guys, I would just like to say, I'm officially a big time creator, and I say this because I officially have fan fiction written about me. Yeah, this is actually like a pretty fucking thick fan fiction that TC Writes 07 wrote about me, and it's actually a really cool story where I get kidnapped by the Joker. It's pretty fucking awesome! <laughs> I thought I'd say that about fan fiction about myself. Shout out to ReaperGirl27 for sending me Batman in Psychology signed by the author. By the looks of it, this is like a full scale book breaking down the psychology of Batman and his lore, and it sounds fucking awesome. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I was sent two separate comic book collections. At Art of Josh Lyman sent me a box that has a bunch of comics in it and a custom cover drawn by him? Like, no shit, I got all of these comics plus a custom Heroes in Crisis cover. That is fucking dope! And then shout out to at Florida MK11 for sending me all of these fucking comics! As well as an original superhero based off me? That's fucking sick! Alright, this is a pretty deep cut reference that not a lot of people will get. But I got sent a very tiny gift from a patron of mine named Gummy Butt. And while I can't confirm it, I'm pretty sure these are knockout arrows, and that's fucking hilarious. I was sent two very heartfelt Christmas cards. Thank you very much for both of the people who sent those. I don't know who sent this mug, but it is fucking glorious. At Local Mischief sent me a fucking Batman stocking. You best believe that this was hung up for Christmas. I fucking love this. At The Womb and Only not only sent me a very heartfelt note, but also sent me a little custom Deadpool leather keychain. This is fucking dope. Naomi sent me a hardback copy of Harleen. I fucking love this book. Seriously, pick it up if you can. Stefan Sijek is fucking amazing. At Crystal Wolf Raw sent me what is going to be the second manga in my collection, aside from the compendium of Death Note that a friend got me, The Way of the House Husband, which I've seen everyone on TikTok. And looks fucking hilarious. Alright, so anyone who's followed me for a while knows that I am a fat ass at heart. Anybody who's ever watched one of my Twitch streams knows that I am constantly snacking. And that's what makes this next thing fucking amazing. At Jossie G sent me an entire box of Canadian snacks. I'm gonna fucking gorge myself. There's also two letters inside. One congratulating me on the end of my semester, thank you very much. And one for Bill the Henchman. Hey Bill, you got fan mail! sent it to get better fucking role models. He, he says thank you. I've said it once, and I will probably say it a million more times, but I have the best fucking fans! Alright, I got a question for y'all. What is a single performance that an actor has done that made it so you can never see them the same way again? I'll go first, I have a few. I've talked about this one a few times in the past, but Jared Leto? He's about to play Morbius, he was in Fight Club, he's been in a bunch of shit, right? Nope, that's just the worst Joker, and I will literally never be able to think that he's a good actor ever again. This, all of this shit, ruined Jared Leto for me, period. And no, don't act like the Snyder Cut made him any better. This Joker sucks, regardless of who's directing. Another person, Mark Hamill. Mark was the voice of, like, 98% of animated characters, period. If you've watched a cartoon, you've heard this man's voice. Not to mention the fact that he's Luke fucking Skywalker. Yeah, nah, that's just Joker, man. I don't care who he's playing, that's the Joker. I hear Joker when I watch Star Wars now. Now for the actor that inspired this fucking video. Sam Neill. Sam Neill is Alan Grant in the Jurassic Park movie. He's like a lovable main character. Yeah, yeah, not if you've watched Peaky Blinders. This man is Satan. What about you, who you got? So I had my first class of uh, my last semester this this morning. Um, so when I got dressed, I just threw on whatever I wanted, and then I ran out and I ran some errands, and I went to see Spider-Man again with a friend. And um, I just got back, and I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and only now am I realizing I have been cosplaying the fucking Punisher the whole day. All black, I'm wearing a fucking combat jacket, white on the chest, I'm even wearing a fucking skull ring. I mean, for fuck's sake! I am literally wearing combat boots. How do you accidentally this shit? What the fuck? Don't let me make my own decisions. Don't let me clothe myself anymore. Going back to fucking classic early days panda where I only wore pajamas and I never did myself up. All right, that's it. That's all I had to say. I have another class at seven. Y'all have a nice day. Did I just wake up from a nap and realize that I haven't made a video today? 
Let's not talk about it. Anyway, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I take one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. All right. You were good to me last time. You gave me someone new on the first try. Let's do that shit again. Manny, Manny, Miney. You. Ah, uh, God damn it! This is Phantoma. We already got here. Okay. Annie, Manny, Miney. You. Who are you? Fuck! You. What is this? Who are you? What is this? Mad Hatter! Um. Okay, so with a name like Mad Hatter, uh. You missing something, bud? Like, I can't really put my finger on what it is, but I feel like you're, uh. Maybe, um. Maybe may, may missing something. Fuck is your hat? Bro, you remember to put on the fucking adult diaper, but you forgot the fucking thing you're named after? Oh, you have so much fucking neck. Also, this might this might just be me, but being mad is not usually something that I associate with heroism. Okay, I shit you not, but this guy is probably the most boring character in his own comic book. Mad Hatter was created by Bill Woolfolk and Mart Leave in Mad Hatter number one in January of 1946. His alter ego is one of Grant Richmond, a junior law partner, and. And that's basically his care. Like, they don't tell me if he's got a backstory. They never explain why he calls himself the Mad Hatter. He's got no powers. I don't even think they'd say the city he's in. He's only really got, like, two interesting things about him. For one, in his later books, he started speaking in rhyme when he was in the Mad Hatter persona. But only sometimes if the writer fucking remembered to give him that characteristic. And the other thing being that all of the white on his costume. Yeah, all that. It's actually white fur. Which is just... Why? There's not really a ton to say about Mad Hatter, he's kind of just a run-of-the-mill superhero. However, they do give me two examples of his villains, which are just way cooler than him. Maybe not cool, more, more interesting. The first one is a man named Humpty Dumpty, who is apparently a criminal genius whose only downfall is that he's incredibly lazy. Which, how do you even become a kingpin of crime if you're too lazy to get the fuck out of bed to do it? How do you even have an alter ego to do the crime if you never actually started doing the crime because you were lazy? Anyway, the other villain is a man by the name of the Gargoyle. What do you think a guy named Gargoyle would be? Maybe some sort of terrifying winged demon? Or maybe a man made entirely out of stone? Or maybe just like a real scary gangster with a sort of stony aesthetic? Well they, well, they didn't do any of that. But what they did do with a character named the Gargoyle is put a gangster's mind inside of a gorilla and then give that gorilla a real life-like human mask. Not human bodysuit, just the mask. And then he wears a suit. I want a book about that guy. Yeah, Mad Hatter got two issues and then was canceled. I wonder why. Let me get some more fun next time. So I realized that I hadn't uploaded anything today, uh, and I get this question all the time, so y'all are just gonna get an answer to this question today. <laughs> was today a particularly difficult or challenging day? No. My brain just wasn't being funny today. This question is essentially asking, do I record one character completely and then record the other character's response to that character? Or do I constantly switch in between the characters while I'm filming? Because oftentimes each character that I'm playing is a different costume, is a different setup, you know, all of that shit. So the thing is, is that a lot of people don't realize is that I, I basically improv all, all of my skits. There's not like a script anywhere. I don't, I don't write anything down. So it's actually a lot easier for me to hop in between characters and film their responses in real time. The only videos I've ever done that are actually, like, scripted are when I am literally adapting pages of comic books. Because otherwise, it's basically just me being sarcastic to myself and hoping that it comes out funny. Actually, a response to this comment on the original video was asking if I do that for my serious skits, which... Sometimes. If I have to get into, like, a full costume to do one side of a serious skit, then no. I film one side of the conversation, and then I film the other side. But if I don't have to change all that much, if it's just, like, a coat or, like, putting on a mask or something, then, yeah, I, I just film both sides at the same time. So, like, my Halloween and Christmas specials, I filmed one entire character and then swapped costumes and did the entire other character. But for the preview video for the Christmas special, where it's Tim and Dick Grayson talking to each other, I just put on a sweatshirt as Dick Grayson and then jumped in between the two characters as they were talking so that it could come across a bit more natural. Ironically, I actually think that I'm less funny when I write stuff down. Because I've done a sketch or two where I actually wrote out a script beforehand and I actually really don't like how they turned out. Any 
anybody who went to my last talent talk where I filmed a skit with Mark Wade will know that I filmed a skit with him that I had written out completely. But once I started editing it, I really didn't like how it turned out because I didn't think that it was all that funny and I don't want to put something out that I don't think is funny. My number one goal when I make these videos is to entertain myself. If I'm not entertained, then I don't want to put it out at all. And that's not to say anything against Mark Wade. That, he did amazingly in acting out the words that I wrote. The problem is that I didn't like the words that I wrote. There's a sort of spontaneity that I can get if I don't write it down and I just jump in between the two characters in real time. A kind of spontaneity that I just don't really get all that much if I write it down. And that's not to say that I can't read from a script and act that out. Like, I've enjoyed acting my entire life. I've been in multiple plays. I, I can act from a script. I just find it easier to, like, adapt my own thoughts, especially when I'm on a time schedule of getting something out every day. Uh, if I just jump in between the two characters and respond in character. So yeah, that's the long answer. The short answer is, yeah, I just jump in between characters most of the time. So for those of you who weren't there, I've been on Twitch streaming literally all day. By the way, if you're not following me on Twitch already, go check me out over there. I have a whole, like, art page that I do over there. It's kind of where I took my making art series that I had on here before I got big for doing comic book stuff, and I just kind of moved it over there and made it real time. Anyway, I'm taking like an hour and a half for a break so I can, you know, like eat and breathe before I have to go back out there and talk consistently for another couple of hours. But since I can't operate unless I have, eh, you know, about three bajillion things on my plate at any given time, welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I take one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. You better be good to me. You better give me someone new. Mini, mini, miny, you. Damn it! We have gotten Phantoma out the gate twice now. Mini, mini, miny, you. Captain Truth! Is that... Is Captain Truth about to rock Uncle Sam's shit? Run your unalienable rights, motherfucker! Ah, no, oh, okay, I see. D Captain Truth is fighting this dude who is mugging Uncle fucking Sam. Who is just taking a casual midnight stroll. What are you gonna steal from Uncle Sam, my guy? The taxes! Run them. Also, is this costume completely comprised of things that the Mad Hatter forgot? Like, he's wearing normal gloves, boots, shorts, cape, and a hat, but he has forgotten pants and a shirt. Imagine if your superhero identity was just getting mostly naked and beating the shit out of criminals. And your name wasn't Wonder Woman, or Elektra, or Black Canary, or Starfire. Women, please get into drawing comics so we can get rid of these sexist-ass costumes. Progress can be made. Look at Captain Truth. I kind of feel bad for making fun of this guy. This is another well-meaning character that comes from a really good place. Captain Truth, otherwise known as the Power Boy, was created by Bob Fujitani in 1945 in Gold Medal Comics number one. His alter ego is that of Ken Elliott, a street orphan. Yeah, like most superheroes, he's an orphan, but unlike most superheroes, he's broke as fuck. Lives in a busted-ass tenement that eventually he gets evicted from. Dirty streets, just he, he lives in a bad place. And that's about all we know about Ken Elliott. Yeah, Captain Truth had one issue. They don't really get into a lot of his backstory. What we do know is that he has a very flamboyant costume and can fly. Do they even attempt to describe what the fuck is happening here? No, not at all. But it might have something to do with the fact that Captain Truth is actually, like, a really good social hero? Like, he doesn't exactly mind the fact that he was evicted from his home because it was completely razed to the ground after that and turned into low-rent housing. He actually believes that criminals can change and doesn't just kick the shit out of them because they're doing bad stuff. Like, at one point, one of his friend's dads has gotten into a life of crime because he needs to feed his fucking family, and Captain Truth goes in and helps him out of it. And while he's at it, he rescues a bunch of tungsten that can be used in the American war effort. Because again, 1945, it, it, you get what you get. So, like, while this character is kind of ridiculous and his costume's dumb as fuck, put on a fucking shirt, man. I think that a superhero that comes from the streets with a costume that's pieced together out of stuff that he could find that mysteriously has the ability to fly and looks out for the lower class is actually a really cool concept. Panda Seal, not regrettable, just fucking weird. Let's get a modern Captain Truth revival going. Y'all, uh... Y'all really said we're gonna use that P.O. box, didn't ya? Jesus, uh, je Jesus fucking Christ, guys. Alright, same rules as last time, I'll say an ad if there's one there, if not I'll say the first name and I'm gonna try and get through everybody, but if I don't get to you, I love all of my stuff, thank you so much. So, shout out to Jessica, this, I didn't even know this was an option, but like, these are, these are panda red cufflinks. I don't, I don't even own a shirt that uses cufflinks, but now I need to get one, cause those are awesome. Shout out to Eric for sending me a copy of G.I. Joe Resolve, apparently this is like a newer animated version of a G.I. Joe movie, which I... Didn't even know existed, so I'm fucking psyched about that. I don't know if it'll beat the one from the 80s. The one from the 80s is pretty fucking glorious, but I, I will definitely check it out. Shout out to Rachel Alford for sending me even more comics. You're only gonna make me buy another fucking long box? Including this issue of Batman that has an early appearance of Jason Todd, which is fucking dope! Alright, shout out to Tangled Web 65 for doing this cross-stitch of a bunch of references to stuff I've done. 
This even has references to stuff that I didn't do on TikTok. Like, that's Jeffrey the Lamp from my fucking Twitch. She even included a drawing that the Wolverine Cool 23 did on Instagram of me. This is so, this is so fucking cool. Next up is buying a frame so I can put that somewhere. Okay, the at here is either DM Ibex or Ibex Wad War King, and this is a, like, wooden plaque of a bat symbol with a Panda Red logo inside. This is just super cool, I fucking love this! I'm like apartment hunting right now and y'all are filling up all of my walls with all this cool shit. Alright, next is a shout out to D&D Kitten J. They sent me a bunch of comics and a Joker mask, but I, ne I need to show you guys the wrapping paper here. They sent it to me wrapped in this like normal Christmas wrapping paper, which is totally fine. But when you zoom in, you realize that all of these little things have references on them. Santa saying good kids get comics, they do. A little comic shop down there. Apparently Batman stole this snowman's singular bone. Rudolph is asking Alfred to call the guy. And this little penguin down here is just saying thank you for being you, and that's just, that's just so sweet. I thought this was all really sweet, right? Yeah, then I flip it over. Deadpool approved tape. That's duct tape. This is such a wonderfully asshole thing to do. I fucking love it. Like legit, I was gonna try and save the wrapping paper because of how sweet it was, and then I saw that and it made me laugh so fucking hard. Anyway, I'll show you guys what's inside. Like, like I said, y'all are gonna make me get a new fucking long box. Like, good god. This mask is gonna give this video a content warning. Shout out to Arya for sending me the only comic she had ever collected, and it's it's Emperor Joker number one. I feel really bad for you giving up the only comic you'd ever collected just to give it to some random fucker on the internet, but th thank you so much, I'm honored. She also sent me a really cool little panda red hood doodle, which is just so fucking cool. You guys have no idea how much I love fan art. Like, it, it, it hits my home, I fucking love it. Okay, shout out to Airly Musing for this cross stitch. It's so fucking cool. I need to go and buy a new frame for it because the frame got shattered in shipping, but like, this is like a Wayne Family Rules tapestry. In this manner, we believe in Batman's workout schedule, the power of the Tim Test, punching Green Lanterns, stealing everyone's bones, always hiring Goonian, getting a little dramatic, the proper definition of a stakeout, and always having Alfred call the guy. I have the best fans. All right, I'm back. I'm Sans a jacket, and this is a part two to the P.O. Box video. Cause y'all really sent me just, just just so much shit. First off, shout out to Nerdy Notions for sending Aaron Michaels his own Arkham ID badge. This is being added to his getup right now. The last time that I was sent a treat box from Canada, it was roughly the size of a shoe box. It was filled to the brim and had a bunch of stuff in it, and I absolutely loved it. Shout out to Jossie G for that one. That one I fucking loved all the stuff in there. This next shout out is to Melly Beam Seven Five Seven. Yeah. So this is the size of the next Canadian snack box that I got. Just, uh, god damn. I am very sorry to say that the Kinder Egg that was in here fucking exploded in transit. However, everything else seems to be intact, and I am super psyched for all of it. Also, in this box, there was a mystery comic box filled with a bunch of comics. Like, legitimately, come on, a bunch of comics. Y'all are lucky I have leftover bags and backers from my comic shop days. Shout out to Joe for sending me another copy of Regrettable Supervillains and Regrettable Sidekicks. I pro I, I have them, I own them, I just- I the, the series is called Regrettable Superhero of the Week, I'm sorry. When we make it through the superheroes, I'll get to the sidekicks and the villains, I promise. Okay, I think I know who sent this to me, but I'm not 100% sure. So if you're the one who sent it, please call yourself out in the comments. Because there wasn't a note inside the box or anything. Forever ago, forever ago, I made a video about the nerd merch that I would want, like, just hypothetical stuff. And one of the things I said was a legitimate train lantern so that I could paint it green and make it a green lantern. You guys are never gonna guess what I got. Look at it, it's so beautiful! It's about to be Alan Scott up in this bitch! This is not the last time you've seen this. This, this will make frequent appearances once it's done. Alright, there's just one last thing. It has a note, it's in a bag. Let me read you guys the note real quick. Bill, you don't know me. You will never know me. The Goonian doesn't have access to this, but I thought you might find it useful. Yes, it does work. Don't ask how I got it. From an anonymous the benefactor. Hey, Bill! Yo, you got a the thing, here. What do you mean I got a, what do you mean I got a thing? Well, all right then. What is it? What's in there? Mind your business. Okay. Well, thank you all for all of my stuff. I fucking love all of it. This is amazing. I have the best fucking fans, and I love you all. You know when you have one of those days that you just, uh, you do the one thing that you had planned to do that day, and then your brain just goes, Yeah, nah, man, that, that was it. Yeah, yeah, I went and toured, uh, an apartment today, and then I just came home, and, uh, well, that was at one o'clock, and now we're here. So let's do like one other thing, so I don't feel like I just burned 24 hours. 
Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly, not weekly show where I take one character out random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run the fuck down. You're going to get a new character this time. We are going to get a new character this time. We are going to get a new character this time. Mini, mini, miny. You. Who are you? Son of a fuck! What did I just say? Mini, mini, miny. You. Who are you? Just, just, Justin. Justin, right? Uh, uh, okay. Uh, Alright, is it Justin Wright or is it just in right? Either way, I get the pun, but like, that's like mixing up Spider-Man and Spider-Man. It's important, okay? It's important to me. Bro, I get the whole thing that you're going for, Justice is blind and all of that, but like, dude, do you really need to be literally wearing a blindfold? That can't be helped. Polka Dot Man was apparently in charge of set design. Also, I'm pretty sure the artist just decided nobody gets eyes on this fucking cover. Also, if Clark Kent gets so much hate for his secret identity just being a pair of glasses, I better see that same fucking energy with Justin Wright over here where he's wearing just his fucking work clothes and a goddamn hanky over his eye. <laughs> this, this character's so fucking dumb. <laughs> okay, okay. Alright, alright. Justin Wright was created by one George Brenner under the pen name of Wayne Reed in Dollman Number 1 in Quality Comics in 1941. Justin Wright's real name is Justin Wright. Justin was an orphan that was handed off from foster home to foster home in his childhood. One day, he's called into the law offices where they tell him, Hey, your biological parents were murdered by criminals and they left you a huge inheritance. Justin goes to check out the home that he's inherited and finds a small box of stuff that his parents left him. Inside, there is a scarf that basically acts like a one-way mirror. It's completely translucent on one side and completely opaque on the other. It's the hanky he's wearing. It's also apparently the scarf that his biological mother was wearing when she was murdered. Alright, now get this. Justin then takes this as a sign that he should don this scarf as a blindfold-like mask to mimic blind justice so that he can wage a, and I quote, one-man war on crime. Why? It's a sign! Don's a fancy suit, which I'm guessing he also found in the inherited house because he's a lumberjack, he probably didn't own that already, and goes to fight crime with only his two rock-like fists as his weapon, and that's a quote. He ain't got no tech, he ain't got no team, he ain't got no hideout, he's just a dude in some thrifted clothes with a found mask who wants to beat the shit out of crime. His secret identity is just and right, that's amazing! You wanna know how he gives the police evidence? I shit you not, he ties it to a brick and throws it through the chief's window. I love this so much. You know what's one part of having COVID that nobody fucking tells you about? The chronic, like, fuck this mindset. Like, you would think being quarantined in a house alone for like at a minimum of two weeks would mean that you would have all the time to get as much as you want done, right? Nah, man, they should listen the official side effects like, oh yeah, you're not gonna want to do anything. Ever. You won't be able to sleep, but you will not want to work, that's for damn sure. So, again, let's do something so I don't feel like I'm just burning time away in quarantine. Welcome back to Regrettable Superhero of the Week, the weekly not weekly show where I pick one character at random out of the League of Regrettable Superheroes and then I run them the fuck down. Alright, you've been finicky these last couple of times, so I'm gonna try something that the comments have been telling me to do for weeks. Now let's try. Eeny, mini, miny, mo. You. Who are you? Gunf- Gunfire. God, have we entered the 80s? Nope, nope, we're, we're in the 90s, that's even worse. I mean, I'm not sure where, but uh, that, that's not, uh, that, that's, that's not a gun, my god, that, that's a hammer. This guy looks like if Wally West was Robocop. Also, Jesus Christ, he doesn't need a weapon, he is a weapon. Is that why the solid metal head of a the sledgehammer is firing the, I don't know, a fucking kinetic beat? What is Ginger Cyclops doing here? Okay, reading this character's description feels like I'm reading a notebook from like an edgy middle schooler. So for those of you who aren't aware, in the mid-90s, comics took a turn to being super fucking grimdark. This was influenced by comics like Watchmen, The Dark Knight Returns, and most importantly, Image Comics. Images were putting out books with way darker stories with original characters. And because of this, Marvel and DC tried to get on this train of putting out darker stories. This is where you get books over at Marvel like X-Force or A-Force. A lot of force over at Marvel now that I think about it. DC also tried to get on that train, and Gunfire is one of those characters. Gunfire was created by Len Wein and Steve Irwin in Deathstroke Annual Number 2 in October of 19... They don't give a real name or bad guys or anything like that, but they do tell me his origin and what his powers are, so strap in. Gunfire is victim to a race of giant alien parasites that feast on human spinal fluid. We are starting off fucking dark. Only a small percentage of these parasites' victims survived, and often they would get superpowers afterwards. This is due to a, and I quote, X Factor in their genes. X-Men ripoff! I knew you looked like Ginger Cyclops for a fucking reason! 
one of the survivors had a different superpower, though. Gunfire's being... That he can turn any object he touches into a gun. My god, if that's not the most 90s shit I've ever heard. His guns don't shoot bullets, though. They shoot concussive force, otherwise known as kinetic energy. You are not making a great case for yourself for not just being ginger fucking Cyclops. And when I say anything he touches, I mean anything he touches. You could pick up a fucking pillow and it would shoot a laser beam of concussive force. Gunfire did, didn't last that long, though. He ended up dying in a random all-out brawl between superheroes and villains that happens all the time in comics. His powers got picked up by some other no-name later. You know what I'm really tired of? Armored Batman. Okay, I agree with this point completely, but it's for the second reason that he lists in that video. The reason it's extremely important that Batman does not appear to be wearing armor is for the fear tactic of a man in a spandex suit tanking bullets and just going at you. Like, I absolutely love the shot in the Batman trailer where he's walking down that hallway and two people are just unloading machine guns into his chest and it's bouncing off. If it wasn't in a Batman movie. Batman's whole deal is that he's supposed to be this otherworldly creature of the night. Something that criminals can't even get their heads around. They're supposed to question if he's even a human being. So him wearing a bunch of super visible plate armor while super cool as like a costume design is like really counterintuitive. There's a reason all of the bat suits are padded to look muscular even when he's not wearing them. It also serves kind of a storytelling purpose. Batman is supposed to be able to tank bullets whether he's in costume or not and be able to take out all of the criminals with ease. But us as readers or viewers are then supposed to see Batman go and turn back into Bruce Wayne when he takes the suit off and you see all the visible damage from what his battle entails. You can't have a Batman that's covered in scars and bruises if your Batman's armor is able to deflect bullets like Superman. Like, Batman's entire original reason of having a cape is to throw off his silhouette so that people don't know where to shoot. That's also the point of the yellow circle, because that's the most heavily armored part of his suit, so he wants to draw gunfire to there. If you can bounce bullets off of his entire suit no matter how many times you shoot it, what's the point of those two iconic elements? Like, using his cape to glide, that's great and all, but like that if that's the only reason he has a cape, he can have a glider like Batman Beyond. There's no real reason for him to have a cape then. In addition to all of this, there's also the fear tactic that he's supposed to give off the impression that he can dodge bullets. Like, what's scarier? The guy walking straight towards you that have bullets bouncing off of it? Or the guy that didn't even get hit in the first place because he's faster than you can see? Batman is a living shadow. He should not give the impression that he's a tank. Don't get me wrong, I'm super excited for the Batman, I can't wait to see it, but I think that if we're going to do an armored Batman, it should be a design similar to Batman Noel, where the armor actually looks like muscles. That way you still have all of the benefits of a Batman that looks like he's in spandex and a muscle suit, as well as having all of the benefits of Batman being armored for viewers of, you know, a movie. I don't know, that's just my opinion. What do you guys think? Do you guys like armored Batman that you've seen in a lot of the movies and Injustice and stuff more? Or do you like comic book Batman more, where he wears more of a spandex suit? Or would you like this sort of middle ground option that kind of has the best of both worlds? Let me know in the comments. You know what's one thing quarantining will teach you? It'll teach you what your go-to depression cures are. Like the thing that you do or you get to try and make yourself feel better when you're not feeling 100%. So tell you what, stitch this and tell me what your depression cure is. I'll go first. So because of my whole brand and everything, you would probably think that my thing is going to comic shops, right? <laughs> no. No, no, you see, my thing is thrift shopping. Specifically, I like thrift shopping for jackets. The thing I usually tell people is I try and look like I have a ton of money while also being broke as fuck. And not being able to do that because I am in quarantine with COVID right now, not great. However, with all the time that I have had, I have tried to start organizing my room a little bit, which has led me to a realization. I, uh... I think I might have a problem. I feel like for my own sake, I shouldn't count how many of these there are. By the way, this is like a shared closet with my roommate, and he has a whole of like, three shirts over here? Uh, I have a problem. What's your guys' depression cure? Okay, I have something to admit. So like many people, I absolutely loved James Gunn's The Suicide Squad that came out last year. Absolutely hilarious, I loved all the different characters, I loved the contrast between the first movie and this one. It's, it's one of my favorite live action DC movies. However, when the Peacemaker show got announced, I, I wasn't excited for it at all. I had absolutely zero interest in watching the show. 
Peacemaker wasn't even one of like my top three favorite characters in the movie. All the marketing looked like this, where it was all America, red, white, and awesome, which is like not super one of my favorite styles of stories. A lot of the humor didn't really seem to hit me. I, I wasn't excited for the show at all. However, since it's come out, I have seen so many fucking posts about this show on TikTok. So God damn it, fine. I will watch one episode and I will come back here to tell you if I liked it or not. You get one, you get one chance, Peacemaker. Do me right. All right, I just binged two episodes. This is a good show. Oh yeah, I should say right now, prop the spoilers. I love that the show admits to the kind of feeling that I had before I went into the show of like not actually wanting the show. Seeing as it was written and directed by James Gunn, I'm not actually surprised, but I am thankful that the character stays the exact same as he was in the movie. Like they didn't all of a sudden try and make Peacemaker a likable guy. He still seems like the same dude that would shank Rick Flagg in the fucking chest. And I gotta say, his dad is the exact type of guy who I think would raise Peacemaker. Also, shout out to the writing of Peacemaker's dad for crafting what is shaping up to be the worst fucking character in TV ever. In a good way. Not like he's written poorly. I mean like, fuck that guy. His personality is, is like so close to a real person that, that it makes him even worse. Also, I've only had Vigilante for like one episode and the clips I've seen on TikTok, but already he's shaping up to be my favorite character. Not even to mention the fact that his costume is the coolest in the show, fight me. I didn't think I was gonna like John Cena as much as I did, but like, he's, the f he's great, he's hilarious. It feels very American in like the setting and everything. They're not setting it in a city, they're setting it in the middle of like just middle America. It feels like home. It feels like a town I grew up in. So weird because it, it feels real. It feels like I've seen this town before. So yeah, excuse me. I'm gonna go and binge the rest of this fucking show. I suggest you do the same. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty fucking good. What does Deadpool sound like? So you ask 90% of people that, they're gonna tell you that he sounds like Ryan Reynolds. Cause yeah, of course, he's had two movies and he's basically the embodiment of the character. Of course he sounds like Ryan Reynolds. But here's the thing, before Ryan Reynolds played Deadpool, what was he supposed to sound like? Because since basically forever in the comics, Deadpool has always had different colored speech bubbles than everybody else in the comic. So usually it's this yellow gradient around the outside of the bubble. But even way back in New Mutants 98, before Deadpool had any of the real factors that make him Deadpool, his speech bubbles were different than everybody else's. So just by like the rules of a visual medium, this should be indicating that he sounds different than everybody else does. And not just in a Batman, he's got a deep voice kind of way, but like a he consistently sounds weird. Or maybe if you ask a 2000s kid like myself who played the Deadpool game. He's gonna tell you that he sounds like Nolan North. So I personally always had this question as a comic book fan and I always assume he sounded kind of diseased. The man's got like stage 11 fucking cancer. Like he is constantly on the edge of death and only being held up by his healing factor. So I'm assuming that his vocal cords are covered in tumors. So I always assumed that his voice sounded like nails on a chalkboard, just rasp and just painful to hear. Just constantly kind of choking in this sort of voice. Which would also explain why most characters don't really want to talk to him that much. Or why everyone is constantly annoyed that he's always talking. So I looked it up and CBR actually did an article about this where they did some research. Their first source is something that Blind Al said, where Blind Al said that the first time that she met him, his voice sounded wet, like gravel and gasoline. So as visceral as that is, that doesn't super help distinguish what he actually sounds like. Like, it's a really poetic way to describe his voice. You can't really determine if that's high or low or gravelly or smooth. So their next hint comes from something that Cable said, where he said that his voice sounds like a hollow Demi Moore rumble. So what does Demi Moore sound like? For those of you who don't know me, I'm Demi Moore. <laughs> I was married to Bruce Willis for the first three Die Hard movies. Which makes sense, because the last two suck. Okay, that doesn't narrow very much down unless Deadpool actually sounds like a woman and nobody mentioned that to start with. CBR comes to the conclusion that this means that Deadpool has sort of a raspy, gravelly voice. Okay, so a little bit more like a smoker. Sort of a whiskey voice, sort of rasp. Okay, that makes sense. But that's not the end of the story. Because later, comic book writer Fabian Nicieza said that he sounds like Dennis Leary in the 1990s. Or at least that when he was writing Deadpool, that's how he imagined him sounding. So what does 1990s Dennis Leary sound like? That's the name of my new book, Shut the Fuck Up by Dr. Dennis Leary. A revolutionary new form of therapy. I'm gonna have my patients come in, Dr. I shut the fuck up now. You know, that actually kind of makes sense. Am I gonna hear anything other than Ryan Reynolds when I read the book? No. Not only because I don't have an inner monologue, meaning I don't actually hear the voice, but also that that's just, that's his voice now. But I do like the idea that Deadpool has a more raspy or gravelly voice. I don't know, which Deadpool voice do you guys prefer? Smooth Ryan Reynolds or raspy Dennis Leary?
Have I ever mentioned that I have the best fucking fans? No, cause like this thing, this thing has multiple different fucking settings that I could set it to. This is the fucking dopest shit. So yeah, this is a, uh, this is a P.O. Box video. Uh, I just, I needed to show you guys that to start off with. Same rules as usual, I'll, I'll thank the people if I have an ad. I didn't have one for this one, so if, who, you're the person that sent me this sh Please, I am begging you, call yourself out. This thing is dope as fuck. Alright, unfortunately the rest of this stuff needs, like, lights. Hold on, let me just... Okay, let's go. Okay, this is another one that I don't have an at for, but I also can't show what it actually does on TikTok, so... This is a, a little Batman pocket knife. Like, it's a little bat symbol pocket knife that somebody got me. So thank you to whoever sent me that. Alright, shout out to at Darth Crackhead for basically enforcing that now I have to do a bunch of Green Lantern skits because they sent me every Green Lantern ring. Like... Like, like all of them. Also, Darth Crackhead, Bill thanks you for the bat repellent that you sent him. I have the box right here. He took it out and he hung it on his on his door. He says that he knows that it doesn't repel people, but he still hung it up anyway. So I, I'm not gonna touch that. Shout out to I happen to believe 420 for sending me a pride flag. I always do my best to make my, my page like a safe space for everybody. So that, knowing that people feel comfortable sending me this stuff, it, it like touches my heart. I have no idea where I'm gonna hang it, but I'm definitely going to try to. And before anybody asks, cause I know that they're going to in the comments, I am straight. I'm just super happy that somebody felt comfortable sending me this. Shout out to at Autobot0087 for like, just like a shit ton of fucking comics. The long box is just gonna be marked TikTok. As well as a golden Legion of Collectors Batman figure that I'm gonna be honest, looks a little bit like an Academy Award. I will find, I will find a way to use this in a skit. I I know me. Shout out to Nilani again. She sent me Harleen a little while back. By the way, her at is pretty black girl, but all of the E's are replaced with X's and there's no I in girl. And this time she sent me Red Hood Outlaw. Y'all y'all are just boosting the fuck out of my home library, I swear. Shout out to Princess Rosie 56 for sending me Arkham Asylum, A Serious House on Serious Earth. I think I have three or four copies of this book now. That's not a bad thing, I love the book. If anything, I'll probably do like a giveaway or something. Shout out to Anasong for sending me all four seasons of Yu Yu Hakusho. Apparently this is a very similar concept to the Eternity Kid from the Legion of Regrettable Superheroes that I read. So I'm, I'm gonna have to check this out when I get enough time to watch the four seasons of an anime. Shout out to Captain Makes Things for this super cool little knit Red Hood bracelet. This is awesome. All right, I got another cross stitch. This one's from Invisible to Only You over on Twitch. Check that shit out! That is awesome! My room is gonna make me look like a really nerdy grandma with all these awesome cross stitches that I'm gonna have all over my room, man. I swear. Alright, last one. This is a knitted red hood hood from At Crocheted by Kirby. I feel so cozy. Alright, guys. Say it with me now. I have the best fans. And that is going to be it for this month. Thank you all so very much for watching. I just want to take a moment to thank all of my lovely patrons over on Patreon. Alicia Vandekop, Allison Knopp, Ash Dolworth, Axel Overcomp, Bill Bro, Blue, Brandon Laney, Cassie Pace, Chaz Masters, C. Randy Gamble, Danny Walker, DeCassuary, Diandra, Dragon Fang, Edgar Lacone, Erica J. Grosskampf, Fancy Man, Gas Boss Gate Light Girl Keep, Gummy Bud, Justin Smith, Jenny Chanty, Kat Stevens, Christina Odd, Linda Mackert, Magu, Mary Baldwin, Matthew Church, Pandora A, Silent Princess, Shannon Lindsay, Silver Bullets 23, Sring, Tarara, The Fire Branded, Theresa Harrison, The Rider of Darkness, Tyler Bryan, Under the Red Hood, Victor Viral, and Zen as well as all of my lovely and generous patrons over on Patreon. And if you too would like your name read out in the credits of every single one of my videos, feel free to hop on over to Patreon and donate $15 or more. Or if that's not possible, feel free to donate as little as $1. Any amount helps. The only way that any of this happens is with your guys' support, so I thank you so very much. It was a crazy month this week with both catching and getting over COVID, so thank you all for sticking around, thank you all for enjoying my content, and I will see you next time.